Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. I am excited to kick off our series of webinars today. The Iowa History 101 series will take place on the second and fourth Thursdays each month during the summer as we share stories about the past lives of Iowans while looking through history through the lenses of work, play, and home. Please refer to our website, iowaculture.gov history to learn more about this series and our other virtual programs, including the upcoming webinar on May 29, in partnership with Iowa PBS, addressing the Carrie Chapman Cat Warrior for Women documentary. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, State Curator Leo Landis. Leo has his Bachelor's of Science in History from Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but his dissertation towards a PhD in History from Iowa State. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie and Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as a curator at the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He has also worked as a curator and director of education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. Now I'm happy to turn over the webinar to Leo. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And Good afternoon to everyone. It's great to be here as part of our inaugural Iowa History 101 series. And right now, Jennifer, my, there we go. My slides are advancing, so I think we're in good shape. Uh, again, want to thank everyone for being here today. And when we talk about baseball in Iowa, uh, the history of the game really goes back to the pre-Civil War era. And so we're gonna talk about the beginnings of baseball in the United States, how baseball came to Iowa, community teams and playing the games, and then the professional era. So it'll be a period addressing up to about 1875. Now, the first thing when you're talking about baseball, a lot of us grew up hearing, or you may have still heard that Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown, New York in 1839. That is not true. So uh, if you came into this thinking Abner Doubleday invented baseball, you can forget that now. Know that the first reference that we have toward baseball in the United States, the town of Pittsfield, Massachusetts had built a new town hall. And so they passed a city ordinance, a town ordinance, barring the games of wicket, cricket, baseball, bat ball, football, cats, fives or any other game played with a ball near the town meeting house. The reason was the town meeting house had glass windows. They didn't want to break any of the new glass windows in the town meeting house with ball games. So that's the first reference we know in the United States to the term baseball in uh, popular culture or in any sort of historical reference. Then by the 1820s, baseball really is showing up more and more. And these are ball clubs. So when I show that 1837 date of the Olympic ball club, they had constitutions organizing the club and they usually had bylaws. And we'll talk about that too. But at least one of the early examples of an extant uh, baseball constitution is for the Olympic Baseball Club of Philadelphia. The game that we know today really begins in New York and, and Brooklyn. The Elysian Fields is the, the grounds where many of the New York clubs play. And so those first recorded New York matches are in October of 1845, 
with different clubs in, in New York City and, and nearby playing on the Elysian Fields. There's then published in 1854, the New York Baseball Rules. And we'll talk a bit more about those, but uh, the competing game was a Massachusetts game. New York clubs adopted their own set of rules and the clubs that were part of that first organization were the Knickerbocker Club, the Gotham Club, and the Eagle Club. And they were a variation of those rules that were being played starting in the mid 1840s. The next big event for baseball as a formal organized sport is that in 1857, the National Association of Baseball Players, and baseball is almost always two words in the pre-1880 era. So if you're ever doing a internet search in primary sources, uh, use, use it as two words. But the 1857 National Association of Baseball Players is formed in New York, and the game is referred to uh, as the national pastime as cricket is in England. So you start seeing baseball being called the national pastime even before the Civil War. Then publications are done specifically devoted to baseball. And the first one, again, it's a pre-Civil War publication. It's called the Baseball Player's Pocket Companion that was published in 1859. And then Henry Chadwick, who is a sports writer in New York City, he published a very affordable little pocket guide called The Beatles Dime Baseball Player. And that was in publication all through the 1860s and the 1870s. Uh, Chadwick will talk a bit about uh, more as well. So why did baseball become the national game and how did it catch on? Well, US men really wanted a game that they could call their own. They wanted to be different than uh, games from Europe. So the advocates for baseball wanted to prove that baseball was their own game. And <clears throat> so that was, that was one reason. Then they also wanted to create rules that made it a gentlemanly and manly game, not boyish. And that was part of the critique about the Massachusetts game was that uh, you could run bases in any order. Well, the New York game had first, second, and third base and then home. And so you did things in a, uh, dedicated scientific and orderly way as well. And so when you look at the baseball diamond for the New York game, it is the diamond that we know today. And so it had very distinct geometric outlines to the, the diamond itself. And so it was scientific and orderly. And then the rules and the practices that were part of the New York game that becomes baseball that we know today really did fit with the, the standards of behavior or the mores of pre-Civil War United States. So uh, in that antebellum bellum era, uh, the ideas around baseball reinforced appropriate and proper behavior for a gentleman. And then it was also healthy, exciting, and fun. So here's a 1855 reference from the New York Herald saying that uh, this beautiful national game is played every evening on the Elysian Fields at Hoboken, the Knickerbocker, Eagle, and Empire Clubs meeting for practice. Two matches will be played in June, one between the Knickerbocker and Gotham, and the other between the Knickerbocker and Eagle uh, clubs. So there you see baseball in a New York uh, Herald article being called the national game. One of the ways we know baseball history is because Henry Chadwick, who I referenced earlier, creates the box score. So here you see a Chicago box score from 1859, so pre-Civil War. And in this case, uh, you're seeing a system of keeping a record of the game in a very simple way. And it's the Excelsior Club, and it lists the players, just like a box score would today if we had baseball uh, playing. And the Columbia Clubs, that first column in this case, that's HL, that stands for hands lost. That's how many outs they made. So uh, a box score today, again, I, I think most of you know a box score, but a box score will list the batters, usually the pitchers today and an attendance and the time of the game. Uh, and that is, that's a standard that goes back, as you can see in this 1859 account. This is a very basic uh, box score. It also, and then in the right column, lists the runs scored. So that's kind of a, a basic box score 
of the 1850s, but they were much more extensive. And, and Chadwick had, he proposed a system for keeping score. And I've been a longtime baseball fan and player. So usually if I'm at a baseball game, either a minor or major league game, I will buy a scorecard and keep score. Here's a more extensive box score from 1858. Uh, two different box scores, actually. One that's more extensive because it's uh, uh, a larger uh, adult club. And the next one down is a uh, club of uh, younger players. And so it was not as extensive. But you see HL for hands lost again. And then the runs. And this lists the scorers for both clubs. It also lists who the umpire was and that lower uh, section. So you see Washington and you see Arctic uh, for the clubs, the two nines. Then you see the totals, hands lost 21. So these are seven inning games in this case. Uh, and it mentions that uh, the umpire called the game, it says. And it looks like the score on this one was uh, 29 to 26. I did the math on the Arctic Club, though, and it looked like it was really maybe only 25. Uh, so that's kind of a mid-level scoring game, by the way. And so when you look at those runs at the end of the seven innings, you see the score. But uh, it also would list the umpire, and so a single umpire. And usually both clubs had to agree on who that umpire would be. So here's the more extensive game account, and these do. They go back to Henry Chadwick, uh, and the uh, New York system of keeping score. And I also like at the end of the uh, account on the game between the Continentals and the Nassau's uh, that they talk about a custom, usually both clubs at the end of the game would uh, give a salute to their opponents and sometimes to the spectators. And so on this one, uh, it says, uh, the umpire called the game on account of darkness. At the termination of eight innings, the Nassau's feeling sore at their, their defeat were inclined to be a little mussy and did not in any way respond to the three hearty cheers and a tiger given by the Continentals. Well, what that means is that the uh, Nassau's uh, did not re respond to the, the salute they were given by the Continentals, that the Continentals probably did a hip hip hurrah or a hurrah 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 and then a big loud growl a roar. so that's what a tiger means it really was a, a, a standard of practice uh, among some victorian uh, social groups so seeing that idea of a tiger uh, isn't unusual so i referenced the baseball players uh, companion as the first uh, <clears throat> publication dedicated to baseball specifically. And here you see the diamond listing the New York game. It also did talk about the rules of the Massachusetts game. But if you look at that diamond on the left side of the uh, scan here, uh, you'll see the players are the players we know. The bases are 90 feet apart as a major league diamond is laid out to be. Uh, there are the pitcher's point in this case, though it was a line of 15 or 12 feet, excuse me. And then the catcher, played somewhere behind home plate, wherever he wanted to be. And also uh, the striker would have a line, not a box. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's where you see that the uh, baseball is, is formally organized, that National Association is creating its own set of rules. And even today in Major League Be Baseball, there's a rules committee that goes back to this early organization and the rules and regulations that you see for the New York game. So the game we know today comes out of New York State. And just to further impress the idea of the popular culture of baseball, this is a Courier and Ives uh, print done uh, pre-Civil pre War, pre-election, using the uh, four political candidates as baseball players. And so you've got John Bell, uh, Stephen Douglas, John Breckinridge, and then uh, candidate Abraham Lincoln, who's, who's got his uh, rail there that is the equal rights and free territory rail as his bat. And uh, Lincoln saying, gentlemen, if any of you should ever take a hand in another match at this game, remember that you must have a good bat and strike a fair ball to make a clean score and a home run. So 
Courier and I have showing, especially in the East, that baseball is a familiar uh, metaphor for American life even before the, the Civil, Civil War. And uh, really one of my, my, favorite, my favorite political cartoons of the pre-Civil War era. So uh, nice, nice reference there. So how did baseball fit with uh, the standards of pre-Civil War America? And this is actually an 1867 publication that this came out of, but these, this is Henry Chadwick's writing. And he wrote this before the Civil War. And he talks about the moral attributes of a baseball player and says, the principal rule of action of our model baseball player is to comport himself like a gentleman on all occasions, but especially on match days. So that's game days. And in so doing, he abstains from profanity and its twin and vile brother obscenity, leaving these vices to be alone cultivated by graduates of our penitentiaries. And then he never censures errors of play made by a brother member or an opponent. He was never known to dispute the decision of an umpire for knowing the peculiar position of an umpire is placed in. He is careful never to wound his feelings by implying that his judgment is weak. And then the last one, uh, it's, it's the golden rule. He never takes an ungenerous advantage of his opponents, but acts toward them as he would wish them to act towards himself. Uh, I still volunteer for the Living History Farms uh, program. So on that third one, I'll usually, uh, talking about the umpire, I'll make the reference saying, yes, it's just like today where players never dispute the decision of an umpire. Talking about uh, examples of fair play then and how the rules and we'll talk about behavior. We talked about behavior with the, the model baseball player. So what is called interference today was a rule back in the 1860s. And so any player who shall intentionally prevent an adversary from catching or fielding the ball shall be declared out. So uh, again, it's, it's umpire's judgment, but that's a rule still today that if a player uh, running the bases interferes with a player trying to catch or field, that runner or player is out. So uh, wanting to say you need to play fair when you're playing baseball goes back to uh, the 1860s. Then you also have unfair base play so that if a fielder interferes with a runner, the runner shall not be put out as an entitled to the next base. One of the other rules that does go back to the 1860s, I didn't single this out, was that uh, there were to be no professional players in this period and that was a rule that players were not to be paid and that was codified in these rules. Also that games should not be gambled on by players and that what those that last one especially tells you is that players probably were gambling or at least in some instances it did happen that's why you make these rules is because it's, it's happening so you need to tell people not to do them so talking about baseball coming to iowa and this is a great shot of the des moines baseball club from about 1870 and it's in our state historical society of iowa collection the uh Men, you can see there are nine men in the photo. And baseball, as we'll talk about, does go back to uh, pre-Civil War Iowa, but this is a great shot of the Des Moines Baseball Club, or one of the Des Moines Baseball Clubs. And one of the first references that I've found, and there may be more, but in looking at the uh, newspaper research I've done is this 1858 note in the daily morning news from Davenport saying that the uh, celebrated shooting match at Allen's race course, there also are going to be other activities, shooting pigeons, uh, a variety of other amusements, but it does talk about, uh, they suppose there will be foot races and baseball and the like to be introduced to drive Dole Caraway. So there you see baseball being talked about as a way to entertain you, not just as a, a game to be played, but that uh, people going to the shooting match could also see baseball and the like. So 1858, we know Iowa newspapers are talking about baseball. And then here's uh, a, a, a mention in May of 1918, excuse me, 1858, uh, May 30th, where the daily Iowa State Democrat talked about the healthy exercise and that quite a number of our young and middle-aged citizens 
have conceived the excellent idea of forming baseball societies and goes on to say all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And so uh, it was a way to occupy uh, idle time. It was furnishing needful exercise and relax you from the toils of commercial life. Well, then the Burlington Hawkeye a couple weeks after that or a week after that runs a reply to that little piece that showed up and keeping in mind that uh, the panic of 1857 was still affecting uh, commerce across the United States, including Iowa. So a panic is another word for a depression or a, or a recession. So there'd been a panic in 1857 and the editor of the Burlington Hawkeye uh, comments in the second paragraph then on the right side, how happens it that our young and middle-aged citizens do not perceive the excellence of this baseball reality? Real, as a relaxation from the toils of commercial life two or three years ago when commercial life had toils and not wait until now when commercial men have nothing to do. So talking about commercial men aren't as busy because of that panic. And it says, uh, baseball societies may all be very well affording invigorating exercise for the muscles and amusement and recreation for the careworn minds of idle and desponding businessmen but the needful relaxation from the toils of commercial life is bosh. So that's what uh, the Burlington Hawkeye editor uh, was commenting on was probably not as much commercial activity and that you didn't need relaxation because commerce was slower than it had been two years prior. And then another 1858 reference. And this shows you that cricket, even in Iowa, is competing as a recreational activity with gentlemen and so the Davenport Daily Gazette reported that cricket and baseball clubs take exercise now, <clears throat> excuse me, take exercise now with a good deal of regularity. The players are improving and will soon be ready to challenge somebody. So there were clubs on the Illinois side of the, the river as well. Uh, I'm not sure if Burlington had a club in 1858. It's, it's likely they did. After the Civil War, you really do see baseball taking off then. Baseball's interrupted by the Civil War, the more Iowa men become familiar with the game. But again, it, you, you can't say that the Civil War introduced Iowans to baseball because we've just seen that Iowa men knew about baseball before the Civil War. But after the Civil War, the game really becomes more and more uh, common. And in fact, Iowans are paying attention to the national activities. So this is a page out of the 1866 Beatles dime baseball player. And on the right side in the W section, you'll see the second name in the W's is the Wakansa Club of Fort Dodge. So Fort Dodge had a club in 1866 and it lists who their uh, president probably of the club was, not the captain, but the president, that's CC Smeltzer. And then if you look a little farther down in the W's, uh, fourth from the bottom, is the Western Baseball Club of Burlington. So the Iowa clubs were paying attention to what happened nationally and were being recognized nationally as active in the National Association. These are all teams listed here and you do, you see teams you know, from all over, especially the, the New England and, and Mid-Atlantic states, primarily Mid-Atlantic, but also uh, there's one from the Richmond, Virginia, the Union Club presumably was uh, men who supported the uh, North in the Civil War. Uh, so you've got clubs like that. There's the Union Club in St. Louis, especially after the Civil War, immediately after the Civil War, having a team called Union Club really meant something. But Columbia was a common name. The Nationals was a common name you'll see on the left side. Uh, so examples of, of clubs that were members of the National Association. And 1867 was a year really when baseball took off across the country and in Iowa. And here you see in the Fairfield Ledger, the constitution for the Fairfield Baseball Club, they published it in the ledger. So you knew uh, that this new baseball club had been formed, that they were uh, having articles of incorporation essentially or their constitution and there's also bylaws. I'll show you the bylaws a little bit better on, the, on a future slide. But 
Iowa teams were using those guidelines promoted out of the national publications saying you need to have a constitution, you need to have officers, you need to have your secretary keeping minutes of your activities. So these really are clubs. Uh, you'll see things too like in section four under article four, which is in the second column about two thirds of the way down saying, you know, that uh, the days for field exercise shall be such as may be appointed from time to time at the regular meeting of the club. Uh, all committees shall report at the next meeting after their appointment, except when nature of their business requires a longer time. So it is, it's, it's just like an organization today. And this is part of that scientific and, and orderly function that I was referencing that they're following, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a constitution as they organize their, their club. And so talking about how the game was played in the 1860s and 1870s, showed you that earlier 1859 diamond, that rules committee would meet and change over time, but rules didn't shift too much. And especially once those bases were laid out at the 90 feet between bases from home to first, first to second, second to third, third to home, uh, really, through the 1870s, the pitcher's position, which was 45 yard, uh, excuse me, 45 uh, feet from home plate, was a box or a line at times, and the striker or the hitter, and so if I ever use the term striker, no, I'm talking about the batter. Uh, they either were starting to see boxes by the 1870s, so they had a batter's box that would be uh, <clears throat> designated as, as the batter's box. And you'll also see in this 1876, there's a little line at the top of the page that says catcher's fence, uh, letting you know that there's a, a sort of backstop that should be provided. You'll also see that the umpire is generally positioned, uh, if you're not a baseball fan or you don't know baseball terminology real well, uh, on the left side of the screen where that box is uh, for the hitter. Uh, that's for a left-handed batter, what a person called a left-handed batter is. And on the right side is, of the screen is a box for what a right-handed batter is. It's what your dominant uh, arm is for hitting uh, when you're at the plate. Well, the umpire is generally shown behind the left-handed batter's position because there aren't as many left-handed batters in, in baseball. Uh, and that was true and being designated in the way uh, the field layout is, is shown. So uh, those are some of the, the differences in, in the game, whereas the field was standard, there was not truly a batter's box through most of the 1860s and the pitcher was not on a mound, they were in a pitcher's box uh, at the time. <clears throat> And I'll talk about those other topics uh, at the host and away and the toss and the steals and bunts, gloves, overhand pitching here in a minute. So balls and bats were also regulated through the guidelines, the rules passed by the rules committee. Uh, there were strikeouts and walks. Uh, pitchers could strike out a batter if the batter and umpires were calling balls and strikes as well through the umpire. There was only a single umpire uh, would call balls and strikes. So strikeouts and walks were part of the game. Uh, the fair foul rule was that if a ball first bounced fair and rolled foul even before it got past first or third base, it was still a fair ball in most of the 1860s and 1870s. So uh, that's a little different than today. Another, another difference, not similar to the fact that strikeouts and walks uh, there also were strategies and tactics and, and both Chadwick and other writers on baseball would talk about, uh, especially for pitchers and or hitters, how to gauge or try to trick uh, your opponent. So even though it was a gentlemanly game, uh, pitchers were throwing twists and spins on their ball. And what I should point out at this time uh, about pitchers, and I'll reference this later, is that all pitching was delivered underhand, even in the major leagues through the early 1880s. So pitching, it wasn't like we think of softball, it was taking your arm back, you might do a windmill, but it wasn't very typical. But because they were only 45 feet from home base, delivering a fast 
pitched underhand hardball was still pretty intimidating. They would put twists and spins and uh, a pitcher named James Creighton in the 1860s, he's often regarded as one of the first to try putting a curve on a ball. So pitchers had strategies. Uh, there were guidelines and suggestions also for hitters in the game. So even though it was talked about as being gentlemanly, uh, it wasn't always done uh, with, with the intent of, of uh, fair play, but that was, that was what was trying to be ensured by the rules. And then one of the big debates in the rules through the 1860s, and it changes beginning in 1867, was that in up till eight, through 1866, any ball caught on the fly or caught on the first bounce was an out. So today a fielder has to catch the ball on the fly. Well, they weren't wearing gloves through the 1880s and into the 1890s. So catching a ball on the fly, especially if it was a hot line drive, a hard hit uh, ball, that did do damage at times to, to players. But the manly way to catch a ball was to catch it on the fly. And so there was even, again, showing the popularity of baseball in, in popular culture, there was a number, there were a number of pieces of sheet music uh, around baseball themes in the 1860s and the sheet music, Catch It on the Fly, the baseball song and chorus was dedicated to the Excelsior Club of Chicago and the Forest City Club of Rockford, Illinois, and it was published out of Chicago in 1867. And again, the argument was that catching a ball on a bounce was a boyish way to put a man out. To catch the ball on the fly was manly. And that's also part of those uh, bylaws get, get emphasizing not the, the catching it on the fly, but the manliness and gentlemanly behavior. And we'll talk about that. But I wanted to share one of the first verse of the uh, catch it on the fly says, come jolly comrade, here's the game that's played in open air. Clerks and all the indoor men can profit by a share. Twill make the weak man strong again, twill brighten every eye, and all who need such, such exercise should catch it on the fly. So it had five total verses. Uh, I, love, I love that popular culture reference uh, and just goes again to emphasize the role baseball was starting to play uh, and was playing in, in American culture. And that 1867 year really is a major shift. It, it's like the year of mourning after President uh, Lincoln's assassination in 1865 was uh, over in late eight, in, in 1866. And so in 1867, people were really ready to get out and start doing things and things take off in 1867. And as an example of another Iowa box score, but how the games were played and I had referenced uh, home and away. Today we think of a, a home team and the visitors and in the game today, the visitors always strike first. And we know in a football game, it's not done that way. It's done to determine who receives the kickoff is done with a coin toss. Well, actually the coin toss goes back to baseball. And so here's a Waterloo uh, Courier account of a Waterloo game in 1874, where it talks about in the first paragraph, the return game of baseball between the mutuals of our city and the stars of Waverly was played on the fairgrounds on Friday afternoon last, a goodly number of spectators being present. The clubs having mutually agreed upon Mr. L.A. Cobb as umpire, game was called at 2.15 p.m. The toss of the penny was in favor of the mutuals who sent the visitors to bat. So the mutuals were from Waverly. They were the challenging club, but they won the coin toss. So they said, we're going to bat second. And, and again, if you're a baseball uh, follower, you know, usually you like to be the team that bats second. Uh, so that idea of a coin toss actually goes back to uh, baseball. It wasn't, you can thank baseball for the coin toss as a way to determine uh, who's gonna strike first or who's gonna receive a kickoff in, in football today. The other uh, comments on this, uh, this is a pretty extensive game account. You don't often see these. And so it just shows you the interest in baseball. But what this one also talks about, uh, you see that players are stealing bases in the 1870s. So if you're ever at a museum today and you hear someone say, oh, they were gentlemanly and they did, didn't, didn't steal bases, 
That's not true. They stole bases all the time. What they didn't do as much were things like bunting. So you won't see the term bunt used much uh, until after 1900. Uh, bunting wasn't viewed as a gentlemanly way to try to get on base. Uh, it would have been viewed as deceptive and sneaky. And you also won't see accounts of the use of gloves. Wearing a glove was not manly. So the first reference I know to any players wearing gloves, there's an 1867 Detroit tournament. And one of the newspaper accounts from that tournament does talk about players having buckskin on their hands. But the use of gloves really only becomes first acceptable for a catcher, a person catching the pitches. And that was a way because they were receiving that hotly pitched ball or were trying to catch a, a foul ball from the batter that might come off the bat quickly. Uh, wearing a mask and protection started to be okay for catchers in the 1870s. By the 1880s, it was pretty typical. And then gloves start to come in for position players in the 1880s and 1890s. But even in the early 1900s, there were a few major league professional ball players who had grown up playing without a glove who were playing without a glove in baseball. So gloveless baseball was typical through the 1870s and 1880s. I had referenced the bylaws of the Fairfield team. Here's a little uh, more extensive view, but what I really like about this is this was again published at the same time as the Constitution was, is the uh, different fines that the club would institute. So the umpire didn't have a fine per se, it was up to the individual club. So today a club can fine a player, that's done sometimes if a player doesn't do something that they're supposed to do like miss a practice or don't, doesn't show up. Uh, also major league or the league president will fine players at times. But in this case, if you look at article four, says any member who shall use profane language either at a meeting of the club or during field exercises shall be fined 25 cents for each offense. And then section two of that article says, any member disputing the decision of the umpire during field exercise shall be fined 50 cents. And then any member, this is section three, refusing ob obedience to the captain during field exercises and while he has lawful authority shall pay a fine of 25 cents. So uh, there's one more fine. It's the member who is absent from a business meeting of the club. That's only 10 cents. Uh, there's one more fine then also who uh, is not coming to order when called upon by the president or captain uh, shall be fined 25 cents. So there's this whole list of fines that the Fairfield Club has adopted in their bylaws. But I, I find it interesting that arguing with the umpire is the most expensive offense. That was viewed by uh, the club as being the most egregious behavior was arguing with the umpire. So again, you can see reinforcing proper appropriate behavior. This would make the game acceptable then for women and young people to watch because you knew that players were going to conduct themselves properly. Just to show that baseball had become statewide by 1870 and talk a little bit more about uh, where players got their materials and also uh, how it reinforced community pride. You can see a, a little snippet there from the Wright County Monitor on the left side of the screen saying that we understand that some of the baseballists of this county are going to have a grand time at Belmont next Friday. We received a friendly invitation to attend and if we can get through with our stacks of job work, we certainly will show our ugly countenance down that way. Well, here you've got the editor of the Wright County Monitor seeing how baseball can help sell newspapers uh, being told about the activities. And so uh, the baseball club in, in Clarion had let him know they were going to have a game. The succeeding newspaper doesn't exist. I looked for that game account to see if there was any report on the game, but uh, either he was, well, the paper doesn't exist as, as far as I know. Uh, I, I couldn't find it and I didn't have a chance to check out our, our microfilm here at the Historical Society. Uh, but there's a nice little account. So a North Central Iowa uh, club by 1870 that's been organized. And then I, I like this West Southwest Iowa, the Page County Democrat Clarinda article as well, showing 
the uh, uh, line score. That game was, as you'll notice, 86 to 26. Those uh, gloveless games were pretty, uh, pretty high scoring in many cases. Lists the home runs, the time of the game, the scorers, but it says the best feat of feeling was exhibited on both sides and all united in agreeing that the need of victory was fairly and honorably bestowed. The meat of victory, excuse me. And the Accidental Baseball Club will have a meeting, so you see the meeting, and it does. It talks about community pride in the, the Clorinda article as well. So uh, saying, you know, the, the stars thought they were gonna take it. The, it was actually a team from uh, Maryville, Missouri, I believe in this case. And so uh, you've got them playing the, the Occidentals of uh, Clorinda. And in 1867, you also had a state tournament that was formed. We've got uh, a good account of some of the tournament games in the annals of Iowa, but the Davenport Scots came in second place. So there's a good account of the uh, outcome of the 1867 state tournament uh, in our annals of Iowa. And I know Jennifer is gonna share some of that to all attendees, some, some references Jennifer and I know. And uh, just also, I, I meant to mention this to start, one of the best historians in Iowa baseball, I give him a lot of credit is John Leopa, who had been at DMAC. And so John has some good resources on, on Iowa baseball that, that we'll share as well. So this is another one of my favorite Iowa accounts and talks about where did players get their uniforms? Well, in the uh, <clears throat> lower center column of this three column piece, it says baseball and it says the Greeks of this city will play a match game with the lightweights of Wyoming. So this is a Jones County uh, account. Uh, so kind of east central, northeast Iowa, Jones County. And it says the Greeks of this city, but if you look down farther, it says that the community took up a $75 uh, collection to purchase the team a suit of baseball clothing and young ladies of the city made up the goods. So presumably the uh, uh, people bought fabric for the team and then women of the community sewed the uniforms for uh, the Monticello Baseball Club in 1871. At the top of that column, it says, this is hearkening back to the Pittsfield, Massachusetts 1791 reference, but no more baseball on the streets People are complaining to me of so much baseball playing on First Street. Windows are being smashed, horses frightened, and other damage done. Hereafter, no playing will be permitted on First Street, and perpetrators will be promptly fined. Please govern yourselves accordingly. S. Jewett, Marshall. And then on the right column, uh, far right, there's a, at the top, talks about baseball. And the editor says, like everything else, we suppose in time it will play out and something else takes its place. So the editor of the Monticello Express thought baseball might be a fad. Uh, we are grateful that that's not the case. Newspapers also showed advertisements of local stores selling baseball supplies. So here's a bookstore in Cedar Rapids selling baseballs and bats and etc. So you presume they had uh, a line of maybe bags, uh, maybe spikes. Players were putting uh, kind of triangular plates on the bottom of their shoes that had little metal cleats on them. So that might've been another supply sold from the bookstore. And just some references from across the state too. We're drawing to an end here uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but the Tama County Republican talked about baseball fever has broken out again. Uh, the youngsters just let out from school are generally afflicted. So that's the top uh, left column and then the Cherokee leader in the southwest, excuse me, the northwest part of the state talks about the Cherokee and Lamar's clubs and again that the game started briskly and that uh, there's community pride connected to a team winning and complimenting the Ma Lamar's club as being fine and gentlemanly and hear nothing but kind words spoken about them. You see in Sioux City the white caps are being organized in 1870 that the ball club had been uh, on the, on the wane perhaps and had been reorganized and again that they hope before the end of the present season to be able to chronicle the capture by our city club of a ball from each of the baseball clubs and that was pretty typical was the winning club in a match would get to keep the game ball so uh, the Sioux City newspaper is saying they hope that the Sioux City club the Whitecaps will capture balls from other clubs and then there's a nice account from the Ottumwa Democrat on the right side there 
Uh, it shows the game score of being 35 to 11, uh, excuse me. And what I like about this account is, again, it talks about the, it ran in the Eddyville paper, but the Ottumwa paper picked it up. But about uh, two thirds of the way down the game account after the box score, it says, so far as baseballing is concerned, uh, it talks about the pitcher, excuse me, of the uh, uh, Ottumwa club. And it says, the onerous duty of umpire was discharged by an Oskaloosa gentleman with justice, fidelity, and discretion. So way to go, umpire. But one of the notables of the occasion is the fact that the Ottumwa pitcher is a one-armed man. So far as baseballing is concerned, another arm would appear to be a superfluous appendage. He is a most excellent catcher. As a pitcher, he knew so well how to send them in that our boys who have been used to a slow pitcher couldn't strike them. So letting you know that the Ottumwa pitcher was a quick pitching uh, thrower with only one arm. So you can see baseball really had permeated all of Iowa's communities, but things start to change in the 1870s. Uh, the first professional association is the National Association. It's formed in 1875. Keokuk has a short-lived team, so Iowa has a team in the first professional league. Then what is today's National League was formed in 1876. Excuse me about that, 1876. 1884 is when overhand pitching becomes standard. And so that changes the game and makes it more similar to what we're accustomed to. And then there's a minor league team in Des Moines in 1885. And so the photograph there on the right, that's the Des Moines Baseball Club that was in the Western Association from 1885. But community teams do persist. Uh, I love that Avoca baseball club photograph. You see the catcher's mask, you see a ball, you see bats, you see the, catch, the catcher's uh, chest protector. When you look closely at that image, uh, it's on our Flickr page if you look at the State Historical Society of Iowa Flickr page. Not all of the players have gloves, so it wouldn't surprise me if uh, some of those players from the Avoca in Pottawatomie County over by Council Bluffs uh, were playing without gloves in 1885, or 95, excuse me. And then in 1900, you see the Olin team, and they also have their catcher's mitts, and some most of the players in that photo have gloves. So it is likely a little bit later, right around 1900. Uh, baseball does persist in amateur ways today. It uh, still is, in my opinion, our national game. And uh, you think of teams like the Clorinda A's that Ozzie Smith played for. That's an amateur team. Von Hayes was a Major League Baseball player who played for the amateur Clorinda A's. Uh, that's one of my goals for this summer, if baseball gets back, is to see a Clorinda A's game. Uh, you've got semi-pro teams up in Northeast Iowa in Dyersville and Epworth and Holy Cross in small towns in Iowa. So community teams are still part of our culture in Iowa. It's been great to be here with you this afternoon and talk about baseball in Iowa. So thank you so much. And with that, uh, Matt, we'll start uh, opening things up to our chat. Thank you, Leo. Uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. Um, however, before I pose the first question to Leo, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions to the Q&A feature right there on your screen. Uh, we are on a schedule, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar, though. Um, but let's get started. We have some time to kind of talk. And I'll start with a really easy one, Leo, uh, from Janet. Do you happen to know the name of the team from Keokuk? Oh, uh, that's one I don't off the top of my head, but I think I know who Janet is. And so I'll see if I can track that down for you, Janet. Perfect. So our next question comes from Doug. Um, and this is, was the position of the umpire in the 1860s and 70s to give him a better perspective on strikes and balls, or was there another reason for his position? Uh, that's, that's what the Haney's Guide, and there's actually a DeWitt's Guide for umpires that was published in the 1860s. So the umpire guides do say that specifically, that for an umpire to, for an umpire to get the proper perspective, excuse me about that, for the umpire to have the proper perspective, they should position themselves so that they can see the ball. And it, it was the, the strike zone was essentially what we think of today from the uh, knees or the middle of the shin up to the armpits. And so if you were making sure the ball came over the plate, the early way to do that was to position yourself slightly off to the side of the 
that was the belief anyway, was off to the side. So exactly right, Doug. Perfect. Um, another question that we have um, is about the team from Rippy, Iowa, and they asked if they were known outside of Iowa. And to expand that question, um, did any other Iowa teams get well-known nationwide at this time in the past? So uh, <clears throat> I don't know of Iowa teams playing a lot outside of our state in that period, uh, other than, you know, our bordering states. So teams would go across to Omaha or to uh, towns in Nebraska uh, or over to Illinois, perhaps Minnesota uh, or Missouri. Uh, the, the teams that were best known in the uh, 1860s and 70s were, were the Des Moines Club in that period were pretty good. Uh, the Scott County Club, as we said in 1867, it would have been known regionally but it, it's more the players that start coming out of our state uh, in the 1870s. Uh, uh, Cap Anson being one of them uh, out of Marshalltown that are, are better known. Thank you. So another question we have is, when did the concept of a mound and pitcher's rubber begin? Yeah, they, it's, I wanna say the 1890s is when uh, the rule change happens on putting a, uh, a mound and adjusting the plate back as overhand pitching comes in, as we said in the 1880s, uh, that it's now a faster thrown ball. And so moving the uh, distance or adjusting the distance from 45 feet back uh, closer to 60 feet, which is what it is today is 60 feet, six inches, and uh, having a rubber or a uh, you know, rectangular strip of, of wood, a plank, uh, as a pitcher's uh, plate or, or what today, as we said, is called the rubber uh, or, and, and a mound then uh, comes in in the 1890s. Perfect. We had a couple questions come up about travel at this time and how did the teams travel uh, to different towns? Yeah, that's a fun one. I, I may have had it and again in the uh, reference for time, uh, sometimes they took trains and so I, I can't remember which Iowa community is, but it talks about then the the team arriving uh, at the depot and being transported by omnibus, which that's a horse-drawn vehicle that could hold about a dozen people. So a horse-drawn omnibus would transport teams to town if they came by train. And uh, so again, if it was farther distance, oftentimes the games were between nearby communities. So if it was only, you know, five or 10 miles away and, and many towns were that close and that's why games were often done that way but traveling by train was, was also done uh, through the 1870s, especially. Perfect. Uh, one question from Lori um, is, how is it and why is it that Abner Doubleday is said to be the inventor of baseball at Cooperstown? How did that mm -hmm. come about? So it goes back to a commission that was formed in the 1890s. I think I've got the, the decade right, that the leaders, especially Albert G. Spaulding, who had been a professional baseball player and then publishes the guides for the National League, wanted to prove that baseball was truly an American game. And uh, a committee was formed called the Mills Committee or the Mills Commission to investigate. And they receive a letter from a source who says, I was there when Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown. And the committee seizes on this and, and anybody who had looked at it would know it wasn't plausible because Doubleday was a military officer in 39. He is not in Cooperstown, he's at West Point. Uh, but the committee wanted to so uh, validate baseball as strictly an American game that they take that letter, the Mills Committee does, or the Mills Commission takes that letter and says, see, here it is. Uh, this is proof that Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown, New York in 1839. And so that is why the Hall of Fame is there. But even the Hall of Fame will tell you today that Abner Doubleday did not invent baseball. Um, so about kind of the beginnings of baseball, Steve asked, so uh, baseball and cricket seem to coexist. Uh, so was cricket, cricket more popular initially? And did athletes play both sports at the same event sometimes? Uh, not at same events. Uh, to answer the last part of the question, they really were through the 1850s 
uh, competing to a degree. And so the New York papers will have stories at times of cricket matches as well uh, in the 1850s. But really, once the Civil War helps baseball permeate American culture, cricket starts to fade as an American interest. And the kind of national fervor around baseball uh, becomes, you know, the baseball fever takes off and uh, cricket really falls by the wayside in most American communities. It's, it's no longer able to compete that baseball, the promoters, and I think it, it is, it's a little more, uh, this is just my own bias, but it's a, a bit more of a active game uh, than cricket. And so baseball uh, is really uh, the, the superior. Some players did play for both clubs, but after the 1860s, uh, cricket is, or eight, mid after 1865, cricket really has, has fallen by the wayside in the United States. And to tie into the early parts of baseball, Tom had a question about, are there any, were there some women's teams in the early era? Um, have you found any in Iowa? You know, I've seen a few references and I had thought about trying to bring that in today, but I, I wasn't able to refine my sources. Uh, I know pre-1880, there are references to them. Uh, I'm not sure I can find any pre-1875 in Iowa, though there were women's clubs in other states before that. So I'm, I'm inclined to believe that there were women, women's clubs uh, before that. And uh, if, if I find one, we'll do a good Facebook post on that. Yeah, that'd be great to kind of see more about that as well. Uh, one question also about people playing the game is we know that universities had teams. Do you know when universities started having these baseball teams? I, I'm pretty sure Grinnell College had, and what was then Iowa College, had a fairly early team. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Cornell uh, in Mount Vernon had a fairly early team. Uh, actually, I know from doing research on this program, the Mount Pleasant Club in 1867 uh, that wins the state tournament the newspaper accounts talk of them mostly being college boys. So that would be what is today Iowa Wesleyan. Uh, so it may not have been particularly affiliated with uh, the college in Mount Pleasant, but the newspaper accounts do talk about them being primarily college boys, so college men. Uh, so uh, the, the formal organizations you do see by the 1880s, especially college teams coming, coming in. Perfect, and we're running short on time. So our last question, um, will actually be, is there any baseball history in Iowa that you wish was more well known? Uh, there are some stories of clubs in the early 1900s that there's actually an African American club out of Algona uh, in the uh, late 1890s, early 1900s. And also uh, the last Iowan to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame was J.L. Wilkinson. Wilkinson was from Algona, but he starts a team called the All Nations Team that was an integrated baseball team that started in Des Moines and barnstormed. Uh, Wilkinson goes on to be the founding owner, owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. And so his story and his promotion of, of you know, equality in baseball is, is one that is deserving of recognition. Uh, former colleague Ralph Christian of the State Historic Preservation Office has, has done some good research on that topic. Perfect. Well, thank you, Leo. And with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. So thank you again to Leo for leading our lecture this afternoon. I know I can say this has been a very informative lunch uh, for me today. Also, thank you to everyone joining us today for the first lecture of the new State Historic Museum of Iowa, uh, Iowa History 101 webinar series. We hope everyone can join us in the upcoming weeks and over the summer for future programs hosted by the museum. The next webinar in the series will be on May 29th, which Jennifer talked about in the opening, uh, and will continue every other week through August. Uh, there are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months, so we hope you can join us. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our web website at iowaculture.gov history. While you're there, you can look into some of our other great digital programs, such as the weekly Goldie at Home activities for young historians, or watch uh, video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our own Iowa City branch. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you in the future. Thank you all.